All right. This book right here. The, the book of Acts. Okay, everybody can see the screen. Okay. Okay. All right. So last uh, Friday, uh, I, we stopped uh, at, um, we were in chapter seven and we stopped before we got to the end because, I, like I said, I didn't want to rush it. Uh, we're getting uh, into some very important uh, parts of the book of Acts, and I want us to really, um, you know, get our focus there. Uh, one of the main characters, uh, and that's Paul, um, we're getting ready to get into where he enters uh, his ministry and how he entered his ministry, but we want to finish up that part of uh chapter seven that we didn't finish on Friday. Okay. So um, remember Jesus, this is sort of like a review and then we'll finish up seven. Uh, Jesus said that it is impossible for old wine skins to hold new wine. Um, and through Stephen, that's who we've been talking about, the Holy Spirit showed how the old tradition of Judaism, especially the overemphasis on the temple, we talked about that, could not contain the new wine of Christianity. Uh, God used Stephen's coming martyrdom to send the church out into the entire world, but God also used Stephen's message to show that there was no theological reason to prevent the gospel from going to the Gentiles, and we know that Gentiles is everybody else but Jews. So the, the whole idea behind a permanent stationary temple is you come to me, right? Uh, this is why Israel, though they were a light to the nations, mainly uh, thought in terms of the world coming to them for salvation. But through the church, God would show a different heart. I will come to you, and that would include the Gentiles, okay? So let's pick it up. In, uh, this would be chapter 7, 54. That's how far we got. That's a long chapter. Okay, 54. Pastor Sam, would you read that? 50, 54, 7, 54. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed their teeth at, and they gnashed at him with their teeth. And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him and ran at him with one accord and they cast him out of the city and stoned him and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul okay so we know we're talking about Stephen uh Stephen was uh, the first uh, deacon and he also gave a very powerful recitation of Israel's history, you guys remember that, and uh, to a point where the listeners, you know, they were, the Bible says, cut to the heart, and they gnashed their teeth, and that means that they were angry at him, and, uh, uh, you know, for even bringing up uh, their history in such a bad way, but Stephen had a way of kind of telling it like it was, um, but it, they stopped up their ears, and they ran to him, and then they cast him out of the city, and they stoned him. So Stephen is considered the first martyr uh, in the New Testament, okay? But at the, uh, the very last sentence there, and the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul, okay? So this is where Saul, later on to be, Name or known as Paul comes into the picture. This is the first time we see him. Okay, so let's kind of break that down. Then they cried out with a loud voice. So when Stephen declared that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God, all of this is a review. We remember reading that. It was too much. The Sanhedrin reacted quickly, violently, and together. Uh, when Jesus, before this same body of men, declared that he would stand at the right hand of God, they had the same reaction. That's when he was crucified. And um, 
uh, reaction and sealed his death as a blasphemer. They told Jesus or accused him of being a blasphemer. Um, it says that they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. So these were distinguished older men behaving this way. Okay. The reaction of the Sanhedrin uh, seems extreme, but it it uh, it's typical of those who react, re, I'm sorry, reject God and or lost in spiritual insanity. So they wailed in agony and they covered their ears at the revelation of God, which they regarded as blasphemy. Okay. It's a dangerous thing to be uh, religious apart from a real relationship with Jesus Christ. This fulfills what Jesus warned them, warned, I'm sorry, about in John 16, 2 and 3. It says, yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God a service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. So Jesus had spoken these words way back in the Gospels in John. There's going to be a time when people think that they're doing, doing God a favor by getting rid of us. Uh, and uh, so that is what's happening uh, at this time. Uh, the reason they want to uh, kill uh, Stephen. Um, it, say, they, it says it ran, they ran to him. So this uses a ancient Greek word, homoio. This is the same word used to describe the mad rush of the herd of swine into the sea back in Mark 5, 13. Remember that? Mm -hmm. um, when the swine went over the, the hillside and they all perished because they had a demon inside of them. Jesus had uh, sent a demon from a, a man into the herd of swine and they just lost control and went over the side of a hill and they perished okay so this mad rush is that same language that uh is used here to talk about how they rushed at stephen to kill him okay with that same madness that those uh, pigs the swine had so this was an out of control mob rushing at stephen if you can get kind of get that picture, okay? So it says that they cast him out of the city and they stoned him. The extent of their rage was shown by their uh, execution of Stephen, which was done without regard for Roman law and which was performed according to traditional Jewish custom of stoning. Did you know that the Jews had a custom of stoning, okay? This is, let me tell you a little bit about it. <laughs> so the second century Jewish writing, the Mishnah, described the practice of stoning. When the trial or when a trial is finished, the man convicted is brought out to be stoned. When 10 cubics from a place of stoning, they say to him, Confess, for it is the custom of all about to be put to death to make confession. And every one who confesses has a share in the age to come. I, I can't explain mm -hmm. what they had in mind there. But um, four cubics from the place of stoning, the criminal is stripped. The drop from the place of stoning was twice the height of a man. One of the witnesses pushes the criminal from behind so that he falls face down. He, had, he is then turned over on his back. If he dies from the fall, that is sufficient. If not, the second witness takes the stone and drops it on his heart. If this causes death, that's sufficient. If not, he is stoned by all of the congregation of Israel. 
All right. Okay. So uh, they had a way of taking care of people that they didn't agree with, didn't they? Mm. Any questions on that? Comments? That's, a, that's, a, that's kind of a brutal way of execution. <laughs> yes, it was. Mm -hmm. All right. I think I'd rather have the electric chair up there. <laughs> yes. Yep. Okay. So let's go back. Um, and the witnesses lay down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. <laughs> okay, so after they stoned Stephen, and here comes Saul, and people lay down their clothes, that means that they are honoring him. They're honoring Saul. Saul stood there as the supervisor of the operation. As a member of the Sanhedrin, he had also approved of Stephen's execution. Young man literally means a man in his prime. Okay, when, that, when the Bible mentions that. It certainly does not mean that Saul wasn't old enough to be a member of the Sanhedrin. In Acts 16.10, Paul says, I cast my vote against him, them. And the plain implication was that he had a vo voice as a member of the Sanhedrin, which is a ruling council. Okay. Okay, 59. Pastor Sam. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. When he had said this, he fell asleep, and then he died. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, and that's what he said. I like Lord, the point where he said, do not hold this sin against him. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So let's break that down a little bit. Then, and then they, I'm sorry, they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and, and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. So Stephen's life ended in the same way it had uh, it had been lived, in complete trust in God, believing that Jesus would take care of him in the life to come. Mm -hmm. Then he said, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. So God answered Stephen's prayer and used it to touch the heart of a man who energetically agreed with his stoning even though the man didn't know the prayer was being answered when we get to heaven we should thank Stephen for every blessing brought through the ministry of Saul of Tarsus so Stephen's prayer unknowingly was meant for Saul okay God heard Stephen's prayer, and Paul is the evidence of it. We have no idea how much God can use us in our time of suffering. Yeah. Matter of fact, that's the time that God seems to get our attention the most and uses us a great deal, even in the midst of our tests and trials, uh, things we're going through, bad situations, uh, if we trust him, he'll bring something good out of every situation. Okay. Yes. Said he cried out with a loud voice. Mm -hmm. Lord, do not charge them with this sin. Oh, yeah. So Stephen displayed the same forgiving attitude that Jesus had on the cross. Yes. Because Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Right. So he asked God to forgive his accusers. And he made the promises loud and publicly that he was teaching us something there. Jesus was teaching us, uh, us something when he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Because you lay a hand on a child of God, apparently you don't know what you're doing because you will pay for it. So Stephen, in, in total compassion, was saying, Father, 
don't hold this against them, them because I know what they can get by doing this to me. I'm a child of God. God protects us. God protects his own. So when people rail after you and misuse you and take advantage of you and all of that kind of stuff, have a forgiving attitude. I know that to some that might not seem reasonable because of, you know, they did this or did this or whatever. Yeah. But they have to face the living God because you are a child of God. They have to face God. Okay. There was a sense in which Jesus suffered along with Stephen as he was martyred. It says he fell asleep. The text describes the passing of Stephen as tenderly as possible. Instead of saying simply that he died, it says that he merely fell asleep with the idea that he woke up in a much better place, much better world, right? And that's what we do. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, when we leave from this space, this earth, we wake up in heaven. We wake up in glory. So it's not like a long time you're sleeping in, in your, you know, tomb. Instantly, you're in the presence of God. Okay. So that's why we always say, don't worry about those who have died in Christ. Because they are in a better place than we are in this world. Stephen uh, wasn't a superman, but he was a man filled uh, through all filled through all his being with the Holy Spirit. Uh, may have a little idea of how greatly he may have little idea of how greatly they can be used. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. I'm reading wrong. Many have a little idea of how greatly they can be used of God as they walk in the power of the Holy Spirit. I got through that. Okay. All right. So any questions that was like the end of seven, the martyr of uh, Stephen and the introduction, the beginning of Paul's journey. And we know that Paul wrote about three fourths of the New Testament, but he was one of the main characters in the stoning of Stephen, in the martyr of Stephen. You know, he was a, we're gonna find out a little bit about him in, in a little bit, okay? So we're gonna go into Acts chapter eight, if there are no questions or if there, I asked if there were questions and then I didn't wait to see if there were any. Does anyone have any questions or comments? I have a comment. When it goes back to Stephen um, after he, he was stoned and in spite of thinking about the pain he had to have felt with them, you know, stoning him with the rocks. And when he asked God to forgive them for their sins mm -hmm. and he fell asleep. When I think of that, I think to me at that point, he was at peace because mm -hmm. he knew where he was going. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't in any pain in my that's where I felt like he wasn't in any pain when he died because he had already asked for forgiveness for them and that's one thing that we have to do in spite of the pain that other people have afflicted on us if mm -hmm. we don't ask uh, God to forgive those people he can't help us and in Stephen's case Stephen asked God to forgive those people and I think when he did that he was so at peace to me when he said he fell asleep he just went to sleep without feeling any pain, any anguish, mm -hmm. you know, or anything that would hurt him. So that good was the point. Mm -hmm. Probably did, uh, Sister Linda. That's a great point. And, you know, uh, in several lists in the New Testament, unforgiveness is a sin. Think about that. Unforgiveness is a sin. So, um any chance that we get to forgive someone who has wronged us, we need to do it. Because what it does, uh, even if that person is not around to receive your forgiveness, maybe this is something that happened, 
years ago and now that you're saved and you you know that uh you want to come clean with god in, in every way shape or form um if you can't reach that person directly then you go to 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 god and say god you know this situation uh, 15 years ago and i really never got a chance to ask for forgiveness as so and so for forgiveness and i want to do that as you stand in proxy for them or something like that if the person can be reached go to that person directly um and ask you know um whatever part i played and whatever the situation was i want to ask your forgiveness amen um, let me say this pastor Vaughn, you, like that. let me comment also forgiveness and that's really one of the things that i had to work with forgive if you're walking with the lord you have to walk in forgiveness you're going to forgive if you're walking holding judges then the mm -hmm. holy spirit is not dwelling within you that's what people don't kind of get to understand it. That's where the main point that Jesus preached. Forgiveness is one of the worst sins that you could walk wow. in. To turn the other cheek, all the other things of that. You have to walk in unforgiveness. You know, you walk in forgiveness. Walk in forgiveness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you have Amen. to, no matter what it is, you know. So that's what Stephen was doing. Uh, he was uh, making sure that he was making things right with God. Mm -hmm. You know, rather they, his accusers and stoners received mm -hmm. it or not, they, they seemed like they were having fun doing what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But he still reached out to God and asked, you know, God to uh, forgive them and uh, don't hold anything against them. He wanted to go to glory with a clear conscience. So it's important on your end. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other comments, questions? Okay. All right. So we're going to go into eight, which is like a continuation of seven. And uh, this is where we see more of Saul. Okay. All right. So uh, this chapter, chapter seven, when does it take place? The events in chapter uh, eight likely happened between 33 and 35 AD. Um, the characters are Saul, which we know as Paul. He was a Pharisee who was a vicious persecutor of the early church. Uh, Philip, he was an evangelist who was one of the seven men selected to care for the Hellenist widows in chapter seven, one of the uh, deacons, mm -hmm. along with Stephen. Uh, Peter and John, they were two of the original 12 disciples, uh, apostles. Um, Simon, a man who practiced magic, uh, magic in Samaria. Uh, many Samaritans thought he possessed the power of God. Uh, we'll see him, the Ethiopian uh, treasurer. He was a eunuch, um, a court uh, official of Candace, who was the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge, uh, and he was in charge of all of her treasures. So all of these people are characters in chapter seven, uh, chapter eight. Where is it taking place? Probably in Judea the region west of the Dead Sea, and the Jordan River. Its eastern border was the Mediterranean Sea. The city of Jerusalem was located in Judea. Samaria, uh, the region directly north of Judea, and road from Jerusalem to Gaza. We hear that name a lot, don't we? So this road was approximately 50 miles long and led to the main trade route to Egypt. Okay, so that's a little information about uh, the winds of what's the where's and who's. Okay, the outline, the believers are persecuted. Uh, in verses one to three, after Stephen's death, the Jews started persecuting the Christians more widely. So the persecution kept going, even after Stephen's death, you know, kind of motivated him, I guess. Uh, the disciples were scattered throughout Judea. Uh, hmm, put an extra E in there. 
uh, in Samaria. Saul, or Paul, was one of the most zealous persecutors. He went around ra ravaging the church and sent men and women to prison for their faith. He was a bad guy. Okay. All right, Pastor Sam, would you start us off with one, two, three? Okay, Acts 8, 1. Now Saul, now Saul was consenting to his death, consenting to his death, meaning Stephen. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem, and they were all scattered throughout the region of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial, and great lamentations over him, and made great lamentations over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering every house, dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yes. Paul, Saul, why'd you do that? <laughs> now, I think sometimes he was a bad... Paul, Paul being a Sanhedrin, I think... He would thought he was doing God's job. We know that it says that he thought he was doing, and he thought he was doing God a favor, mm -hmm. getting rid of these people who called themselves the way. Right. Mm -hmm. What is that? The way. You mm -hmm. know, I'll help God get rid of them. You know, mm -hmm. he actually thought that. Mm -hmm. Okay, we'll see it. Okay. All right. So let's look at and break this down a little bit. Uh, it says, uh, made great limitations over him since Jewish law pre uh, prohibited open mourning for someone that had been executed. Luke's uh, record suggests that these devout men publicly repented of Stephen's murder. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, and we know uh, Luke's record talking about the book of Acts. You know, uh, Luke wrote the book of Luke and he also wrote Acts. Okay. Uh, it says he made havoc. This uses an ancient Greek word that could refer to an army destroying a city or a wild animal, animal tearing at its meat. He viciously attacked Christians, including women. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. So because of, you know, this persecution, they began to scatter, <laughs> which, you know, God has a funny way of doing stuff because that's exactly what he said in Acts chapter 1, 8, didn't he? Mm -hmm. He says, go into Samaria and into Judea and to all parts of, so they dispersed from being in one place. And they start preaching the word in different places. So the end result was for the glory of God, because the persecution simply served to spread the message. We shouldn't think that those who left Jerusalem left as formal preachers. Most were accidental missionaries. <laughs> it just happened. Who talked about Jesus wherever they go. And what we call everywhere evangelism, right? So we can be just like these early Christians. We can share the good news of what Jesus has done in our lives, every opportunity that we get. Most Christians don't come to Jesus through a professional preacher or an evangelist. They come to Jesus through pe people just like us. And I, I tell people all the time, sinners don't wake up on Sunday morning and say, you know what, I think I'll go to church. No, the Bible says that you have to compel them and tell them, keep inviting them, keep sharing Jesus, you know, because, you know, it, it's not natural for them to get up and go to a Bible study, get up and go to church or anything that deals with the Lord until you share Jesus with them. Okay. All right, Saul's supervision of the execution of Stephen was just one example of this persecution. The idea behind the ancient word, uh, sonidokia, <laughs> I hope I pronounced that right, it is to approve or to be pleased with. So Saul was pleased with this stoning of Stephen. 
Some people are reluctant persecutors. Mm -hmm. Saul wasn't one of these. He took pleasure in attacking Christians. He took pleasure. Right. Saul well, loved Tarsus. Mm -hmm. uh, were you about to say something, Pastor? No, I, would, I don't know if, well, he, he had thought he was really doing God's work. I don't know about the pleasure part, you know. You know. I, think, you know <laughs> I, I think he took pleasure because he thought he was doing God a favor. Right, yeah. I mean, the, uh, when you do your job sometimes, like a hard job, you don't, you. I think, he, well, it's, mm -hmm. I think I think he was doing it. I think he had pleasure at getting yeah. rid of these Christians. Yeah. <laughs> okay, Saul of Tarsus, uh, whom most of us know by his Roman name, Paul, later came to deeply regret his persecution of the church. So we know later he he you know had change of heart change of mind, change of spirit, change of everything. God to totally changed him. So he was radically saved. I like that. Yes. So it says a great persecution arose against the church. Stephen's death was only the beginning. The floodgates of persecution were now open against the Christians. Everywhere they went, everywhere they went. And Saul was only one of many persecutors of Christians. This was the first persecution of the Christians as a whole. Before the apostles had been arrested and beaten and persecuted, every believer was threatened with violence and perhaps even death. So the early church, they, they went through something. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't think the church today could hold can hold up because um it, you know the church today has a whole different idea of what church is all about. These people took it totally serious and um even to their death and many people became martyrs mm -hmm. in the early church. Okay. Well the churches now the churches and the church in America you're absolutely right. right. The churches in uh in in India Churches in Sudan, churches in Iraq, churches in Afghanistan, North Korea, they are going through persecution, especially in Sudan and, and, and other parts of Nigeria Amen. and Africa. So. And China also, they are not stoning them, but they're putting them in concentration camps and re-education camps and making them, you know, live a terrible life. They have to do it undercover. And Amen. you're absolutely right about, could we go through this? Would we? Right live in an undercover church type world there, you know. Okay. So, mm -hmm. okay, so here's a little picture. I found a couple of pictures of uh, what Saul probably uh, looked like. Um, this is uh, when he, when God got his attention on the road to Damascus. We'll see more about that. Okay. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God. Some several pictures of the one at the top left is a stony. Again, that center picture uh, is uh, when he was stopped on the road to Damascus and blinded by God. Talking before the Sanhedrin. So just a few little pictures and I want to I got a little uh, video it's a drama dra how do you say dramatization uh I think this this guy does a really good job of, of giving us an idea into the personality uh into the life into the thinking of uh Saul Paul I think you'll like it
My name's Saul, but you can call me Paul. I know two first names, it's a little strange. Allow me to explain. See, I was born in the city of Tarsus to a couple of very devout Jewish parents who made sure that from the time I was very young, I went to school and memorized the Torah. You know, the first five books of the Old Testament. Yeah, all in my head. I quickly rose to the top of my class and before long I was handpicked by one of the most famous rabbis in the land to be his student. He picked me, Saul, over all my other classmates because, well, I was the best. I knew my Torah better than anyone. I was a Jew above all other Jews. And I wasn't even just Jewish. I'm also a Roman citizen. Now this was a privilege that not many of my friends shared with me. But because I came from a wealthy family, I inherited my citizenship from my father. So I could go places only Romans could go. I could do things only Romans could do. And along with all the other perks and privileges of being a Roman citizen, I was also given a new name. Paulus, or Paul for short. So that's me, a man with two names. To my Jewish friends, I was Saul. To the Roman officials, I was Paul. And life was pretty good living in both worlds. I could travel anywhere, I could do business with anyone. But I always kind of hated it when people called me Paul. Not just because I didn't want to be associated with the corrupt Romans, but because Paul in Greek means small. I much preferred to go by my Hebrew name. You see, Saul was the name of the first king of Israel, and he was anything but small. He was taller, stronger, more handsome than anyone in the land. Just sharing his name made me feel like Jewish royalty. And I basically was. When your teacher's a famous rabbi, people start to recognize you. People start to know who you are. And I liked it. I liked that people knew my name. I was proud to be called Saul. But then one day there was a different name on people's lips. Jesus. He was this new rabbi in town that everyone was talking about. The guy was only about my age and he already had disciples of his own. And not just a few. But hundreds of people followed him around, making all sorts of outrageous claims. People calling him a prophet. Others thought he might be the Messiah. A few even worshipped him as if he was God. Can you believe that? How stupid can people get? A man being treated like God? That was blasphemy. Jesus was just a regular guy like me. No, less important than me. He came from the hick town of Nazareth. His father was a poor carpenter that never amounted to anything. He didn't have any money. He didn't train under a famous rabbi. Jesus was a nobody from nowhere. But I was jealous. I wanted people to talk about me the way they talked about him. I hated him. I just wanted him to go away. And I didn't have to wait too long before some of my friends took care of business. Some of my fellow Jews made contact with one of his closest followers and convinced him to betray his master and hand him over. By the end of the night, the high priest ordered that Jesus be killed. Oh, it was about time. Someone did something. This foolishness had gone on long enough. And the next morning, Jesus was handed over to the Romans for a proper criminal execution. Now, the Romans had their flaws, but they were masters of death. And their crowning achievement was crucifixion. It allowed them to inflict the maximum amount of pain and humiliation on their victims while keeping them alive as long as humanly possible. 
But Jesus deserved it. So they tore him apart with whips made of bone and glass. They, they shoved a crown of thorns on his head like he was some kind of king. And then they marched him up a hill and nailed him into a cross and hung him out in front of the whole city for the world to see him for what he really was. A false prophet, another dead end, an empty promise. A sign above the cross read, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. Did people really still think that this was our king? I mean, if this was God, why didn't he come down off of that cross and show us? I'll tell you why. He couldn't. He was just a man. And he hung there helpless until he died. And so that was that. Or so I thought. A few days after Jesus had been buried, I began to hear rumors. People saying that they had seen him alive. <laughs> Are you kidding me? After everything. After Jesus was put in that tomb, I thought he would finally leave me alone. Oh, but it gets worse. Groups gathered to talk about him. Fellow Jews prayed to him. They even baptized each other in his name, forming this new religion, this cult. They called themselves the way. Well, I wasn't about to stand by and watch as the God of our ancestors was betrayed like this. So I made it my mission, my life's work, to stamp out this foolishness wherever it started. Now, the name Saul would strike fear into the hearts of anyone foolish enough to associate themselves with Jesus Christ. For years, I hunted them down. Day after day, I stood by and watched as they were beaten, thrown in prison, and killed. And every night, I thanked God for using me to rid the world of these liars and lunatics. But of all the men and women that I rested over the years, there's one face I can't get out of my head. A young man named Stephen had been brought before the Jewish high court for questioning. His crime? Blasphemy, like all the others. But unlike the others, when he was asked to give a defense for his charges, he spoke without fear. He spoke of our forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He told stories of Moses and the Israelites. This kid clearly knew his Torah. He even reminded me a bit of myself. And the more he spoke, the more I found myself agreeing with almost everything he had to say. Right up until he mentioned Jesus. He pointed at us, pointed at me, and shouted, You have betrayed and murdered the righteous one. At that, the whole courtroom was thrown into chaos. Judges rushed at him, dragged him out of the court, dragged him out of the city, and started throwing rocks at him. The poor kid had sealed his fate. The whole time, Stephen just prayed. And with each hit, his body became more broken and more bloodied until finally he fell to the ground and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. I couldn't believe it. His final words were a prayer for the men who were killing him. I seem to recall Jesus saying something similar. What made these people so crazy? What was wrong with them? What a waste. Stephen would have made a great rabbi. In a different life, he might have even been one of my students. Oh well. And there's one less Christian to worry about. So that was my life. Catching and killing Christians. It started in Jerusalem, but that wasn't enough. This movement, the way, was spreading far faster than I had imagined. 
So I got more letters signed from the chief priests and the Roman government. I used my dual citizenship to its full advantage to take these Christ followers down. I would travel to nearby cities and bring back anyone I found there that called themselves a Christian. Once I got them to Jerusalem, they didn't stand a chance. These letters were as good as death sentences. So I set off for Damascus with some of my companions. We were walking down the road, talking, joking around like it was any other day. <sighs> any other day. Little did I know what was about to happen. Just as we were outside the city limits, suddenly a bright light flashed all around me. And then I heard it. A voice. It was almost as if the light was speaking to me. It said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? What? I didn't understand. Who are you? His next word shook me to the core. I'm Jesus. No, 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 no. Jesus was dead. I saw him bleed out on that cross. I'm Jesus whom you're persecuting, Saul. And at his final words, everything went black. I couldn't see. I was blind. I fumbled around in the dark until I found my companions and they led me the rest of the way into the city. They tried to offer me food and drink, but I couldn't. I felt sick. My very soul felt sick. What had just happened? If that wasn't Jesus, then what was going on? But what if it was? Oh no. All those people. Stephen. God, what had I done? I, I was the one who betrayed you. It was me. I I had bad mouthed you. I cheered while they drove nails in your hands. The whole time I I thought I was the good guy. I thought I was doing what you wanted. Now I don't know who I am anymore. I didn't know what to do. What do I do? So I just prayed. I prayed the hardest I have ever prayed before in my life. For three days, I didn't eat, sleep, or drink. I just cried out to God. I must have said I'm sorry over a thousand times. And then on the third day, I got a visitor. A man named Ananias said God had sent him. Well, he was a Christian. So I, I figured God must have sent him. Because what? Christian would want anything to do with me after what I had done to them. He put his hands on my eyes and these things like scales fell out. And slowly my world came back into focus. I could see again. And you'd think I'd be happy I still felt so lost in darkness. And as if he could read my mind, Ananias said he wasn't just there to help me see with my eyes. He was there to help me see with my heart. He said, you were wrong, Saul. Jesus was the Son of God. He was exactly who he said he was. And he had died. But he hadn't stayed that way. And now, we can be forgiven for anything.
Nein. No. No, not me. Not after what I've done. Not after who I've been. But he said, Saul, would you like to be forgiven? Yes. Yes, please, yes. And then a Christian prayed for me. A Christian baptized me, Saul, in the name of Jesus Christ. One man went under the water that day and a different man came out. Everything changed after that. I spent the next few days in Damascus, but instead of arresting people for preaching, I joined them. I was making all these connections from the law and the prophets and the ministry of Jesus. I could quote these prophecies from, from my childhood, word for word, and now explain how it all pointed to Jesus. It all is fulfilled in Jesus. I was filled with this, this fire to speak, this, this passion to preach that I had never experienced before teaching in the synagogues. I had good news and I couldn't keep it to myself. Well, most people call me Paul now. And I don't mind. In fact, I'm, I'm proud of my Roman name. Even though it means small. Because it reminds me that my name must be small so that God's name can be great. I'm the chief of all sinners. The most arrogant idiot of all. But now God shows me off as living proof that he can save anyone from anything. Including you. If you have been wandering around in the dark, Jesus is inviting you into his light. All you have to do is open your eyes. Let's just stop for just a second. What do you guys think about that video? Did you like it? I loved it. You did like I that. I really enjoyed it. Yeah, it was beautiful. Yes, it was very informative. Mm -hmm. I, I thought of um, what, um, that scripture, I mean, not the scripture, but what you said had, that uh, Paul had pleasure in. Mm -hmm. Um, killing the Christians and, and, and I was thinking he was actually jealous of Jesus mm -hmm. because he wanted to be the limelight and he wasn't mm -hmm. and then after he found out who Jesus really was how he was very um, sorrowful for the things that he had did mm -hmm. especially, especially killing Christians Amen Praise God Anyone else? he told that story pretty accurate you know um to help make a whole lot of points you know in the story sometimes a uh, uh, pictures picture is worth a thousand words and so uh he, he's uh he's a good storyteller and uh he did a good job so i just wanted to get your opinion on that okay let me go back. Get my right point here. Okay. All right. Uh, just to cover a little bit more on Paul, and then we'll, we'll talk about um, mm -hmm. going to start talking about uh, Philip. So Saul of Tarsus, he was a Jew, 
uh, from the tribe of Benjamin. Again, so we know that uh, Benjamin was the youngest of the um, uh, uh, the twelve children's uh, children of of uh, Jacob, and he was born in the city of Tarsus, which today is uh, Turkey. Uh, he was raised in Jerusalem, uh, Judea. Uh, Tarsus was a free city in the Roman province of Sicilia. Uh, Cilicia, I do that every time, and Saul's parents uh -huh. had become citizens of Rome. So that's how he got, got the Roman name, uh, Paul. He, he kind of told that story too. So thus, uh, by birth, Saul also had Roman citizenship. He trained in the Torah. The Torah, you know, as mentioned, is the first five books of the Bible, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. And that's what the Jews study. Mm -hmm. That's what the Jews study. So he was proficient. He had memorized it. And that's what the Jewish kids do now. Uh, they memorize the Torah. They also memorize uh, the New Testament uh, in their training before their bar mitzvah. And uh, so uh, he trained in Torah, uh, which are biblical studies and law under the most respected rabbi of the first century, Gamaliel. Saul considered himself to be zealous for God and a Pharisee, which is a member of, it should be an ancient Jewish sect, commonly held to have uh, pretensions to uh, superior uh, sanctity. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, Gamilia, um, that's who he trained under. Again, again, he was uh, a rabbi who had instructed Paul. Uh, and Paul taught it, this authority under Gamilia, as a credential for why the Jewish crowd in Jerusalem should hear him out. Read that. Uh, one verse, Pastor Sam, Acts 22, 3. Okay. And he said, I am a Jew born in Tarsus in Sicilia, but brought up in the city, educated at the feet of Gamaliel, according to the strict manner of the law of our fathers, being zealous for God as all of you are this day. Amen. So always <laughs> very, very zealous for God. I mean, and uh, he very, really very proud. Favor, yes. Very prideful. Mm -hmm. And I think the guy did a, you know, he did a great job in bringing that mm -hmm. out mm -hmm. uh, because he was a very prideful man, but God got that under control, didn't he? Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Under Gamaliel's teaching, Paul developed an expert knowledge of the Hebrew uh, scriptures. And this educational pedigree gave him access to preach in the synagogues mm -hmm. wherever he traveled. Gamaliel's influence extended beyond just his own teaching then and filtered down to Paul and Paul's understanding of Jesus being the fulfillment of the Jewish law. Okay. Although Saul was a tent maker by trade, he had become a Sanhedrin's, uh, the Sanhedrin's prosecuting attorney, according to uh, Acts 18, 3. He was present at the execution by stoning of uh, Christianity's first martyr, Stephen, and may have been one of those in Cilicia who had argued, argued with Stephen in the synagogue, according to those two scriptures. After his involvement with Stephen's death, Paul set out to destroy the messianic community, also known as the way at that time. Okay. And then we saw that on his way to Damascus, on road to Damascus, uh, Saul of Tarsus encountered Jesus and he had a change of heart. And I... Um, I know he talked about that, but I want to read that. And I'm going to ask Pastor Sam if he would help me. Uh, chapter 
uh, it's actually in chapter nine, verses one through 31, because mm -hmm. there's some things I want to bring out. I'll start reading. We'll alternate. I think there's like four screens, Pastor Sam. Okay. Okay. So then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from him to the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he traveled, he came near Damascus and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. Then he fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Of course, that was Jesus. And he said, who are you, Lord? I think he knew who he was, right? Then the Lord said, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the gourds. He said, trembling and astonished said, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what do you want me to do? Then the Lord said to him, arise and go into the city and I will, and you will be told what you must do. So that's, uh, we often... <laughs> Talk about people who encounter the Lord. They have a Damascus experience <laughs> you know, where God just stops you in your track and, and um, just, you know, shows you the light. And he showed uh, um, Saul the light. He was actually on his way to Damascus to get, he had gotten authority. He wanted authority. So if he found any of those people who were talking about that, the way stuff, he wanted to bring them back to Jerusalem. So that's why he was on that road. And, uh, so, but God got his attention. Okay. Pastor Sam, pick it up there. Okay. And, and the man who journeyed with him stood speechless Hearing a voice, but seeing no one. Then Saul arose from the ground. When his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, neither ate nor drank. And then Ananias baptizes Saul. Now there was a certain disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, he said, here I am, Lord. So the Lord said to him, arise and go to the street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. Who behold, he is praying. And in a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much he has harmed he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Okay. So uh, and here he is. Uh, he encounters Ananias. And Ananias, through the Lord, is told what to do mm -hmm. uh, when he finds uh, Saul, and um, so Saul was told earlier to go to this house, and he would be told what to do. He was blind for three, what is it, three days and three nights or something like that, and and uh, I believe, I believe all the time God was speaking to his heart. Mm -hmm. I believe God was speaking to his heart. Amen, amen. And okay. let me make a comment there, and because of Saul's commitment to serving God in the way with the zeal that he had. So he knew when Saul accepted Jesus Christ, he was going to take that same zeal that he had for thought he was serving God in the right way and serve Jesus Christ in the right way. Well, and, and that's what he did. Mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. Then we know that he wrote, like mm -hmm. we said earlier, about mm -hmm. three quarters of the New Testament. Yes. You know, because he began his travels. We're going to get into, um, we're going to get into his travels a little bit later. 
and uh, see all of the stops that he made and what he did when he encountered those people, all of the mirror signs, wonders, all of the things that God did through him. Uh, seven, and the men who journeyed with him stood speechless hearing, uh, I'm sorry, I didn't change my screen. <laughs> that sounded familiar. Okay, but the Lord said to him, go, for he is a chosen vessel of mine. Amen. God already recognized who it was. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name to the Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So there you go. Mm -hmm. For I will show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Mm -hmm. And Ananias went his way. And entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, Brother Saul, Brother Saul, <laughs> Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you came, has sent me that you may receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, God not only commissions you, but he fills you and he, he empowers you for service. Immediately, there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received a sight at once, and he arose and was baptized. So when he had received food, he was strengthened. Then Saul spent some days with the disciples, with the disciples at Damascus. 20, immediately he preached the, the Christ in the synagogues that he is the son of God. So total turnaround. And that's what happens when you get saved. Total turnaround. I mean, you know that you know that you know that God has done something in your life. It's not superficial where you can go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Some kind of way, it might not be as dramatic is what happened to Paul. Paul had a special assignment, but he does it in some dimension of that to everyone. Everybody has a Damascus Road <laughs> experience in on some level. You know, after you've been, after you, if someone shared the gospel with you, uh, after you hear the message, after you read something, and it just hits you. It's like, okay, God. And you answer the call. And God calls you to be his own. Then he begins to change you. And you begin to forsake the life you had before. And do a, and do a Paul. And do, what is that, a 180? Turn completely around from his old thinking. The old stinking thinking. And to turn around and totally was sold out to the Lord. Okay. Okay. All right. Many mistakenly believe that God also changed his name from Saul to Paul. How however, Paul is simply, we found that out, the uh, Greek form of the Hebrew name Saul. So as Saul began to minister outside of Jerusalem to Greek-speaking Jews and Gentiles, he went by the Greek form of his own name, much like a Spanish-speaking Roberto might go by Robert when in an English-speaking territory or vice versa. So that's how that happened. And with, with as much zeal as Saul of Tarsus had previously persecuted the church, he now set out to spread the gospel to everyone who would hear. I mean, that was his mission, and he didn't stop. Ever since that Damascus Road experience, he didn't stop. Mm -hmm. He didn't stop. The Apostle Paul spent over 30 years in ministry for the gospel through street evangelism, church planting, uh, itinerant preaching, and uh, composing inspired letters, deleting important doctrine that now 
are included in our scripture. The zealous mm -hmm. law abiding Pharisee was relieved of the burden of earning his own righteousness and freed by Christ's person uh, perfect. I can't talk tonight. Mm -hmm. Life sacrificed on the cross for the forgiveness of all who would believe. Okay. Any questions, comments? Okay. Okay, Pastor Sam. Christ is preached in Samaria. And we, we're going to flip over from Paul and kind of get into Pete, uh, uh, Philip. Therefore, those who were scattered went everywhere preaching the word. When Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them, and the multitude with one accord heeded the things spoken by Philip, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. Along with the word, miracles was going on also. For unclean spirits crying out with a loud voice came out of many who were possessed and many who were paralyzed and lame were healed, and there was a great joy in that city. Okay, so let's take uh, some, let's look at some of that. Um, well, in Acts 1, 8, Jesus clearly told his followers to look beyond Jerusalem mm -hmm. and uh, bring the gospel to Judea, Samaria, and to the whole world. But to this point, Jesus' followers had not done this. You know, they were still kind of, they had got scattered, but they were still in the central parts of Jer the Jerusalem, Israel area. So the resulting good of the spread of the gospel leads some to see this persecution as being the will of God. God can and will use pressing circumstances to guide us into his will. Sometimes we have to be shaken out of our comfort, comfortable state before we can do what God wants us to do. Just imagine if everyone, like I said, everybody's not going to have that dramatic uh, uh, Damascus Road experience where you get knocked off your horse or whatever and big light shining in your but you're going to have an experience. But just imagine if everyone who accepts Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and just began to take up the mantle of doing the work of the gospel and not waiting for everybody else to do it, but everybody just assumes their position in the ministry and starts doing something and begins to tell people, no matter where you are, no matter where you go at work, at school, wherever God opens your mouth and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And I think for the most part, people still have a fear. And if that's you, if you have a fear, of sharing Jesus Christ, a lot of times it's because you don't think you know enough of, about the Bible or about Jesus to do it adequately. Well, to that I say, start reading the Bible because that's where you get the information. So it's not just by osmosis is going to jump into our heads. We have to open up the book. And we have to read. The best places to start reading as a new Christian is the Gospels. The best, uh, which is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. The best Gospel to start with, I would say, is John. Because John um, is a good book that kind of really gives you a pretty thorough overview of the life of Jesus Christ. So if you're talking about him and sharing him, this is where you get your information. So we got the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And we're going to stop here, by the way. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. But then we got smack dab in the middle of the letters. We got the book of Acts. So the church starts and we see 
up to this point, what has gone on from the infilling of the Holy Spirit in the upper room all the way where Paul and Philip now, we're going to see some more disciples. We're going to follow the road uh, that uh, that Paul traveled, he, uh, he and his uh, disciples. And um, then we got the letters after Paul uh, travels to these other places, places, these other cities. Then he follows up. He builds a church and then he leaves overseers at those churches, like pastors or teachers, evangelists, you know, people would stay there. And then he would uh, write letters to them. Uh, he would hear about some things going right. He would hear about some things going wrong. And he would write a letter. Hey, I hear that you guys are, um, you know, doing some things that are, uh, praiseworthy. And I I just want to thank you for doing that. And then he might discipline a lot of people because they were doing wrong. A lot of his letters are uh, in the attitude of correction. So when we read those letters, they were originally written to those early churches and trying to get their act together. Remember, these are pagans coming into the Christianity these are Romans. These are uh, Jewish people who they were Jews at one point. So we got pagans. We got Jews. We got we got a whole collection of people coming into this new way. And some of them were trying to bring their old habits, their old idols, their old, you know, thinking. And, and so Paul had to get them straight by correction. And so he would write letters, he would revisit, and so so on and so forth. Then at the end of the letters, you, we have revelation. Not revelations, not with an S, just one revelation. And uh, we know that the book of Revelation tells us how things are going to end. So um, we're going to stop there here and... And uh, again, let me turn off my recorder. Any questions uh, before we end tonight? Okay, turn this off.